steady and strong about uh, winning this uh, war that has been declared on America. A goal of victory, not compromise. And later, wars changed countries. World War II made the United States a world power committed to an international role isolationism left behind. Vietnam left the United States more cynical. Americans had learned their government could lie to them. This time, unity so far, agreement on a goal so far. Will that change if the struggle is long? We can't know. The fight is just beginning. Bruce Morton, CNN, Washington. And the fight is just beginning. Our coverage of the aftermath of these terrible tragedies is continuing. Uh, we're going to be back in a minute uh, with more coverage. Uh, jo joining us, uh, CNN's Joey Chen and Bill Hemmer. And I'll be back as well. Aaron. We are yet again in the middle of another extraordinary day. The things we have seen thus far today, Joey, again eclipsing what we have seen yesterday. And it continues to be a story that we are on top of here in the interest of our employees and colleagues. Another shift change. I'm yes. Bill Hemmer in Atlanta. And I'm Joey Chen. And, and we do have to note that uh, not only uh, the very hard work of our friends in colleagues mm -hmm. in Indeed. New York and Washington, but a, the great interest all across the nation as people tune in to CNN to find out the very latest. We'll hear from Judy Woodruff in just a few moments. First, let's get a quick look at where we are at this hour. There is late word from New York. We are now being told very disturbing to us. We can't uh, quite put our finger on why this has happened yet, but we are being told that the reported rescue of five emergency workers, which had been reported earlier in the day here on CNN, did not happen. It did not take place. Officials say they don't yet know how the story began to circulate, but CNN is still looking into this, and we're trying to find out more about this. Back at Ground Zero, the effort to save lives is indeed threatening lives itself. At least one major skyscraper is feared to be wavering now, and some strong storms, possibly with heavy winds, are on the way into the Northeast. More than 4,700 people are reported as missing and believed to be in the rubble. In Washington now, the government puts the number of dead at the Pentagon at about 190. Now, that includes the victims from American Airlines Flight 77, which is, of course, the flight that crashed into the fortress on Tuesday. We get this very late word. A rescue worker tells CNN of pings being heard from the rubble, pings that could lead to the airplane's voice and data recorders, those so-called black boxes. Said to be so critical in any investigation of any airline that goes down. We are being told right now that United Airlines Flight 93 that went down in Somerset County, Western Pennsylvania, apparently officials there indicating that the black boxes there have been picked up. Kelly Arena, live in Washington. Kelly, what do we know? Well, Bill, justice officials say that, yes, they have confirmed that they did find that black box. Um, all along, officials have been indicating that that would probably be the first black box to be uncovered. And I'm sorry, flight data recorder. They're so-called black boxes, but the, the correct term is a flight data recorder. Um, that, that would be found because that was the cleanest crime scene to deal with. It, it was the only plane that didn't crash into a building. It is a, it is a crime scene that investigators have easier access to. Now, that was the flight if you remember, that was um, traveling from Newark to San Francisco. It carried a, uh, a passenger load of 38 and a crew of eight. It is also the flight uh, that we have heard uh, various stories from. Uh, yesterday, CNN did receive a partial copy of a transcript, uh, air traffic control transcript from that flight, uh, where we know that the uh, one of the hijackers told passengers that he had a bomb on board. Uh, we also know that one of the passengers on that flight called home and said that the male passengers on that plane had, had voted together to uh, decide to try to overtake the terrorists. So, so we do have some, some real life drama uh, that we know about that occurred not only in the cockpit but, but among the passengers on that flight. Again, the black box has been found. This could be very helpful to investigators. They were hoping that they could uh, find these uh, flight data recorders intact. It would help with the investigation. Um, you never know what you will hear that may lead, may lead them to uh, investigators to finding more information um, about uh, anything that, that could help them pull the threads of this investigation together in terms of identifying more about these terrorists, uh, possible cells, terrorist cells operating within the United States, but a very uh, good piece of news for investigators, Bill. 
Kelly, let me stop you here because we're talking about the flight data recorder. That's right. What about right. the cockpit voice recorder? Well, the cockpit voice recorder, uh, which is uh, what, what air traffic control had, we, did, we do have a, um, a partial transcript of that that we released yesterday. Uh, mm -hmm. The microphone, though, was keyed on and off, so it's not a continuous uh, transcription. It was, it was something where there, it sounded like there was a scuffle uh, between the, the pilot and the terrorist at the time trying to turn it on and off. Um, so this, this may yield uh, more information if it is indeed intact. All right, Kelly Arena, come back and check back in as soon as we get more information. But again, United Airlines Flight sure. 93, again, the flight data recorder has been recovered, which would be so critical to finding out altitude and other situations possibly on board that plane before it hit the ground there in western Pennsylvania. More now with Joey. Joey. Bill, meantime in all this, the Attorney General John Ashcroft is saying that the FBI is working on literally thousands and thousands of leads in these cases. Here's some of what we've been able to learn so far. Authorities say that they believe 50 people may have been involved in the attack. They also say that Arab individuals had recently inquired about aircraft availability at Eastern Air Charter in Norwood, Massachusetts. Law enforcement officers say that these individuals may may have been the hijackers or at least part of the planning team. Federal sources, meantime, have identified two men, Mohammed Atta and Marwan al-Shahi, as the suspected pilots of one or two of the planes after they were hijacked. Both men had trained on a flight simulator in South Florida. In time, police in Hamburg, Germany, brought in a woman for questioning in connection with the attacks. German authorities have also detained a male airport worker. Germany's top prosecutor says that three of the suspected hijackers were of Arab descent and are believed to have lived in Hamburg. This time, uh, the commercial jetliners are back in the air again all across the United States. For the first time in the nation's history, U.S. airports, airspace has been closed to all non-military planes since after Tuesday's terror attacks. The only airports open right now, though, are those meeting the tough new security requirements. Transportation Secretary Norman Mineta gave the green light this morning, saying that airports have to be open on a case-by-case -case basis. Many of today's flights were those diverted to Canada on Tuesday after the attacks in New York and Washington. Travelers arriving at airports are being met by scores of federal marshals, police, and canine units, which are all part of these new security measures. Some of the other things we're picking up on right now, Joey, the New York Stock Exchange will not reopen tomorrow and Friday as had been planned earlier, but rather on Monday. That is now the target day. They'll do some testing over the weekend on Saturday, but trading right now set to resume the usual time, but it will be far from usual, 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time Monday morning. Also, the National Football League has made a decision it will cancel week two of the NFL season. All games are off for this weekend. Games set to resume on Sunday, the 23rd of September. Also, Congress has passed a resolution today urging the country to fly the stars and stripes. For the next 30 days, if you spent much time outdoors, you can help not help but notice the a lot of folks doing that already, getting several calls here that various outlets across the country giving away flags at times, and several major retailers have run out of those flags at individual outlets. One report said 80,000 have been sold in New York City alone. Also, another note, a sign in the skies, combat aircraft patrolling above some major U.S. cities, including Washington. We saw this over the Pentagon and other buildings there today. In words and gestures today, U.S. officials are speaking unmistakably of war. Now, uh, back on a story that earlier in the days had raised many of our hopes and hearts. The news we had heard is that five firefighters who had been lost since Tuesday had been located in an SUV buried beneath the rubble of what remained of one of the World Trade Center towers. Now we are told that story was not true. CNN's Martin Savage rejoins us now from New York with the latest on the story. Marty, I don't understand. How could this story be so far off course? Joey, this is a heartbreaking development here that we have just learned within the last half hour. This confirmation that no firefighters were found coming to us from the fire department itself, even though the fact that rescuers who claim that they saw the rescue take place, even though that the New York City Police Department confirmed that in fact they had been found, even though Bellevue Hospital had said that yes, they were expecting them, it turns out the miracle that everyone was so joyous about did not occur. Authorities say the way the confusion came about on the site was the fact that there are so many rescue workers and so many firefighters working in the area trying to find survivors 
that several of them fell down a steep pile of debris and actually fell underground. They were rescued. When they were rescued, apparently by all the other rescuers that were out there, it was misinterpreted as this dramatic saving of five firefighters. It is an absolutely heartaching development that it is not the case. Authorities simply say there was no miracle. And there's other disturbing news coming to light now. Authorities are telling us that there have been several arrests made of members of the media, the local media, apparently posing as firefighters or as federal officers in their attempt to try to get closer to the scene for the purpose of photography. They have been taken into custody. And now other concerns, buildings falling down, two specific buildings. One is the One Liberty Plaza building in which there is grave concern about the stability of that structure. And then there is the World Finance Center, which is also thought to be in danger of possible collapse. Not that it's imminent, not that it's coming down right this second, only that there is structural problems. It has been weakened from the foundation. In both cases, they say it was the collapse of the World Trade Center towers that undermined the foundations of these buildings. They may look sound from the outside. They may even, in some cases, be new. But that does not mean that they are not a legitimate threat to those that are trying to work down below with this tremendous danger that is overhead. They are taking every precaution they can. They continue to monitor these buildings, but they know that the search for survivors is job number one. It's precedent, and the people here believe it is worth risking their own lives to try to find them. And then there is the problem of weather. They have enjoyed good weather now for the past two days. It looks excellent now. We are told to expect a dramatic turn sometime after midnight. One of the things that they have anxiously been working on here is trying to get all the massive amounts of equipment and supplies under some sort of cover. Heavy rains are expected and perhaps even high winds. None of that is good news for the rescuers on a day that is ending with a very bitter note. Joey. Marty, talk to me about this. Uh, you said that there have been some reports of people trying to sneak into areas that they clearly did not belong in, yet they have to really close off all of lower Manhattan, in effect, to make sure that the, this scene is safe. I mean, that is a big area around the World Trade Center. How are they able to do that when so many of the security resources have to be devoted to the, to the rescue effort directly? Well, they have brought in officers and law enforcement personnel from all of the surrounding area, the surrounding region, to be exact. And you have state police officers, you have federal police officers, you have local police officers, county police officers, all coming in from different jurisdictions, different communities, all coming in, though, with the purpose of trying to secure this area. Keep in mind, it is not just a matter of trying to keep the public out. It is not just a matter of trying to keep the media in check. This behind us here, as devastating as it is, as huge as the destructive area that is covered, is a crime scene, first and foremost. And everything that is out there is considered a piece of evidence, perhaps a vital piece of evidence, no matter how small. So trying to preserve that for the purpose of the investigation and ultimately finding out who is to be blamed and who is to come to justice is vital. Hence the reason why the media is allowed to get close, taken up usually in groups escorted by officers, but we are not given free reign in this area, and you could understand why. Certainly can Enjoy. understand that. CNN's Martin Savage covering the latest developments from the scene of the search underway in Lower Manhattan. Note to our viewers, in just a few moments, we're going to hear from CNN correspondent Elizabeth Cohen. She's at one of the hospitals, which has become something of a center for the many, many thousands of people who are looking for lost loved ones, friends, family as well. We're going to hear from Elizabeth in a few moments. First, we want to continue with more on the investigation itself. And the human story, that armor we saw it so clearly about 30 minutes ago, back there in a moment. Orland Sydney from our weather department just about 45 minutes ago came down to tell us that the weather does not appear to be as severe as some thought before. They're thinking rain after midnight Eastern time tonight, but then stopping by noon Eastern tomorrow, just about a 12-hour period. After that, Orland thinks the skies will clear once again, and that should be indeed good news. You mentioned the investigation though, Joey. The Attorney General John Ashcroft said they are pursuing right now thousands and thousands of leads and many of those leads going up and down the east coast of the United States and Mike Betcher trying to get a handle on things at this point and joins us now. Mike, what are you finding out? Well, it's been very busy today, Bill. As you said, Ashcroft reported that there are 18 terrorists or were 18 terrorists aboard those four hijacked planes but four of those men, uh, pardon me, two of those men are the object of an intensive international search. 
that stretches the Atlantic from Florida to Hamburg, Germany. Uh, those men are Mohammed Atta, who we will show you in a photograph here, and his uh, friend Marwan Al-Sheri. Both held United Arab Emirate passports, but it's not clear if they are actually citizens of that country. We know, for example, that Atta had a, an Egyptian driver's license. In Hamburg, Germany, German federal police launched an extensive search of an apartment shared by Mohammed Atta and Marwan Al-Sheri in February of this year. During an additional search of another apartment that may have been connected with the two men, a woman was taken away for questioning. During the night, a total of eight apartments were searched by German police. Now back across the Atlantic in Pompano Beach, Florida, FBI agents have converged or did converge on a small rental car company called Warwick's. Records show that Otta rented an automobile at that location between August 15th and August 29th. And during that time, he put a remarkable 3,000 miles on that car, according to the contracts. The FBI also came here, a company called Flight Sim in Opalaka, Florida. The owner said three men, Otta among them, paid cash for six hours of flight instruction on a Boeing 727 simulator. Their instructor, Henry George, said, however, they weren't too interested in takeoffs and landings. What they received was uh, a familiarization flight more than any kind of uh, formal instruction. That, uh, not, uh, I don't have any records of exactly what we did, but what my uh, memory uh, what I can recollect from my memory is that uh, we mostly did turns it, uh, in a couple of approaches. I don't think we did any more than that. It, uh, it was, like I said, it was not a structure. It, was, it wasn't uh, our typical or normal uh, lesson plan. CNN correspondent John Zarella conducted the interview with Mr. George. Uh, you'll see more of that interview later today. Agents knocked on hundreds of doors today, and uh, other agents from other countries did the same in coordination, trying to find these terrorists. But before it's all over, they're going to be knocking on tens of thousands of doors. Joy? CNN's Mike Betcher for us following the investigation. Other developments in the investigation today. We told you just a short time ago that the flight data recorder, one of those so-called black boxes from the Pennsylvania crash site, has now been located. CNN's David Mattingly is on the scene now in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where the investigation there is underway. David, what do you know? Joy, as you said, just a short time ago, the FBI finally revealing they have recovered the flight data recorder, the first of two critical pieces of evidence in this investigation, the other being the cockpit voice recorder. Now, that device is being taken from here. It was found in the impact crater. It's being taken from here to Washington, D.C. for further examination. Now, this news comes just hours after learning today that there are two other areas where debris has been found, some as far away as eight miles in the town of New Baltimore and uh, another site a couple of miles away from here in the town called Indian Lake. Small pieces of material scattered eight miles away, uh, but investigators say they have determined that is completely consistent with the kind of weather patterns and the type of impact that we have here. Again, giving you some idea of just how powerful the impact was when this jet crashed here. Back to you in Atlanta. CNN's David Mattingly for us out at Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Now we continue particularly looking into the search and rescue efforts. Here's Bill. Joey, you look at some of these numbers coming on New York City today, and they're just astounding and staggering. The numbers we're getting 6,000 tons of debris removed so far. That's just the beginning. I'm the, basically the tip of the iceberg that we're seeing in southern Manhattan. We are also starting to see the struggle, the human struggle, in so many ways played out in Manhattan. Elizabeth Cohen on the streets there outside the armory where you're hearing the worst of it, are you not, Elizabeth? Oh, definitely hearing the worst of it, Bill. There are hundreds of families standing in line behind me trying to get word from the authorities about where their loved ones are. The authorities are asking them for any kind of identifying information. They're asking them for dental records. They're asking them for blood samples from close relatives so that DNA can be matched. And people are, are standing in line around the corner and have been here, hundreds of them, all day. I have two people with me, with me right here. 
Naomi Konovich is looking for her brother-in-law, Andrew Zucker. Yeah, your brother-in-law calls your sister Correct. Tuesday morning. Um, Andrew calls Erica right after the first plane crashed and said, I'm okay, I'll call you back. Hung up the phone and we haven't heard from him. The only thing we heard were reports that he had evacuated his office, told everyone to leave. The last thing we heard was from his secretary who said that he was on the 70-something 70, 70 floor on his way down the stairs. Um, but he's a very good soul, and we're just afraid that he might have gone back to try to help more people once they announced the building was secure. And you, we did a story with you yesterday. You've been hospital after hospital yeah. searching. Um, I've been, yesterday I was at NYU and Bellevue and down by St. Vincent's, um, passing out pictures, talking to people, finding out lists, calling hospitals. My sister, my parents, and friends are calling hospitals, personally going to hospitals. I came down this morning. I walked from 50th. I took the subway to 14th. I walked to St. Vincent's. I checked their list. Um, I walked all across World Trade Center and up West Street, giving out flyers to people going down to the World Trade Center to Ground Zero. Um, today, I came up to um, the Armory, and I filed a report with them. I handed in his dental records, his fingerprints. Um, all the information they wanted, hair follicles, gave them pictures, and we're just hoping that someone heard or saw something or can give us some confirmation of where he is, some real valid confirmation that's been verified. You've had some problems with some internet sites where yes. one site said he was okay. But there are these New York.com survivors, there's New York City.com. They have lots of websites that have people on that are saying they're okay. Um, I can go on and put anyone's name in that I want, and it's false. They, these records are not verified. They're giving out um, a phone number for the New York Greater, the Greater New York Hospital Association that's putting up a verified website of people that they know the status of and where they are. Um, and that's the only thing I think that's verified. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm also here with First Lieutenant Michael Rodriguez, who is looking for his sister, uh, Lisa King. Um, what is the last your family has heard from her? Um, on the, uh, the day of the attack, the, uh, Lisa had called uh, her husband Jim and, uh, you know, said, you know, that she was all right. And I guess she called back or she was on the same phone call. You know, she was hysterically crying. and. She said that they're finally getting us out of here, and um, so the, I guess she started on her way. But uh, you know, again, we don't know if she took the, uh, the stairs down, the elevator. Uh, we don't know. She was in Tower Two and any 89th floor. And um, uh, again, the uh, you know, when I got over there, I mean, I couldn't do anything. The building just started collapsing, so I had to run away. And uh, you know, going uh, yesterday, uh, we got a, a glint of hope that maybe uh, someone found her. Uh, but what it was was it was a piece of ID, and we got a phone call about you know four times removed from the actual person that uh, called, and said that they found a, an ID that had her name and, and uh, address on it. But uh, the person that they pulled out was uh, um, a uh, an unconscious uh, female. So other than that, we don't really know. Just that the person was there and they were unconscious. It could be her. It could not be her. We don't really know. And uh, we're trying to, to verify that. You know, it went down a, um, all over the place yesterday um, to Ground Zero, to uh, the triage centers, to the Moron Center. Um, nobody's really had any uh, luck in, in keeping a good uh, list going of who uh, who is who and where they went. And uh, there's a quite a good possibility that she went to New Jersey, but uh, we don't know. You know, we, we we don't know if she's conscious. We don't even know if that was her. I mean. We're just trying. Lieutenant, thank you. Thank you. I thank appreciate you. it. In addition to looking for his own sister, Lieutenant Rodriguez and his platoon are helping um, with some of the efforts here. He was in the armory today helping other families look for their lost loved ones. And there is just story after story, thousands of stories like this here at the armory here in Manhattan. They just keep on coming, unfortunately. Yeah, Elizabeth yeah, Cohen there at the armory. While well, we have it here, a quick clarification I want to make. You were talking with David Mattingly in uh, Western Pennsylvania. We were told in the past hour many people have thought there might have been military action, right. U.S. military action taken against that United Airlines flight, but the FBI investigator on the scene says he was that very is quick not the case. He was yeah. the beginning he of his press conference. He was either today, so. misspoken or misquoted, whatever the case may be. I want to clarify that. All right, we have talked about the investigation. We have talked about the very human concern for loved ones who are lost right now. And we want to move on to what is likely to become the, the uh, response of the United States. Back to Judy Woodruff in Washington. Judy? 
That's right, Bill. Uh, here in Washington, much of the focus uh, at the Pentagon right now on the outside is the recovery efforts. Uh, they say they've all but given up hope for any survivors there, but the work very much uh, proceeding to uh, pull remains that they can find, and there's been no slow down in that effort. But on the inside of that building, which is, of course, the military uh, and defense center for the United States, some tough talk uh, about uh, what are the options now given this terrible attack on the United States. CNN's military affairs correspondent Jamie McIntyre. Uh, Jamie, we are hearing uh, the kind of language out of the Pentagon we haven't heard before. Yeah, very strong words uh, indicating that there will be military action taken against the foe, which right now is simply called terrorism. They haven't really put a name to it, even though uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell today did say Osama bin Laden the prime suspect in this event. Some of that tough talk coming from Deputy Defense Secretary Paul Wolfowitz, who uh, today said that uh, the U.S. military response, the U.S. response would be a sustained military campaign, even though he wouldn't say uh, what U.S. strikes uh, might target or discuss any specific military options. I think one thing is clear is that you don't do it with just a single military strike, no matter how dramatic. You don't do it with just military forces alone. You do it with the full resources of the U.S. government. It will be a campaign, not a single action. And we're going to keep after these people and the people who support them until this stops. Wolfowitz also praised the strong bipartisan support the administration has gotten. The, today, this afternoon, a uh, uh, congressional delegation uh, made up of some of the top uh, leaders, both from both sides of uh, both houses of Congress and both parties uh, in Congress, uh, toured some of the wreckage at the Pentagon. Wolfowitz said uh, that the uh, uh, support for the $20 billion in additional funding that President Bush has asked for to fight terrorism is very welcome. He said some of that money, although he didn't say how much, would go to uh, increase the readiness and the ability of U.S. military forces. Some might go, he said, to pay for some of the combat air patrols that have been uh, over major uh, U.S. cities over the last couple of days. Judy? Jamie, any discussion there at the Pentagon about the fact that the as they talk publicly, obviously where they're not telling us uh, the details of what they're thinking, but as they talk pub publicly about striking back at those responsible for what happened and those who might be planning something else against the United States, this every day that goes by gives these people, whoever they are, whether it's Osama bin Laden and his network or others, it gives them time to scatter and to hide, in effect. Well, the, it's going to be, the, and everybody in the administration has made this point, that whatever they do is going to have to be a long, sustained campaign. It's not going to be a quick strike or a quick fix. Uh, the instinct, the impulse is to want to react uh, immediately and uh, uh, take a proactive stance against terrorism. But in these cases, prudence often dictates uh, a more measured response, a, a time to uh, accumulate intelligence and be able to make uh, a, a response that takes into account not just the first strike, but what comes uh, in the days after that. What's the follow-up? What will the fallout be? So you need to have a really carefully thought out and measured campaign if you're going to take embark on military action. This is really a case, Pentagon officials say, where you don't want to shoot from the hip. And, Jamie, not something where the president necessarily is going to need congressional uh, support. Is that right? Um, I think, first of all, the president has a, 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 an enormous congressional support for whatever military action he decides to take. It's not something that you would need to have a, a vote in Congress for. In all likelihood, if a military action comes, it's something that we'll find out after it's taken place. All right. Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. Uh, we want to show you some pictures now of one of the first aircraft uh, traveling here out of the Washington area. This is Dulles Airport. This is the site of one of those fateful flights that uh, the airport that uh, the flight uh, that ended up going into the Pentagon left from on Tuesday morning. This, uh, we're told, is an airline, and I can't read the name of it. It looks like ANA on the tail. This is one of the very first airplanes to be permitted to take off again from this airport in the Virginia suburbs outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, restrictions uh, just being lifted uh, by the Federal Aviation Administration, but, but uh, restrictions on travel being imposed in a way that 
uh, people are going to be very, very, uh, it's just going to be much more difficult to travel many more security uh, measures in place. Joining us now are Washington Bureau Chief Frank Sesno, who has been, Frank, talking with a number of people here in Washington about uh, what it's going to take for, for the United States to move ahead with some retaliation in the way of cooperation with our allies overseas. Frank. Trudy, talking throughout the day to a number of officials, current administration officials, those who assembled the last uh, grand international coalition in the first Bush administration, and political leaders as well. And let's get some perspective here. What there is remarkable unanimity on is that this is, in fact, going to be a prolonged effort. Don't think just in terms, just in terms of military action, though that almost certainly is in the offing as well, but also in terms of concerted and sustained efforts to cut off the money supply, transit capabilities, command and control centers, uh, efforts to coordinate and communicate, uh, not just by the terrorist groups, group or groups that are associated with these dastardly attacks over the past several days, but in point of fact, as part of a broader campaign, a war, if you will, on terrorism. That's what this administration wants to do, and that's what officials say in this administration as, and as as I say in previous administrations say is needed now that's going to involve several things let me give you some examples it's going to require co strict coordination with the current batch of allies to include Europe and the friendly states in the Gulf and Russia Russia is, I'm told is giving some what's called terrific signals back to the US an example on Tuesday the Russians had planned military exercises in the Pacific Judy the United States said to the Russians that would send an unfortunate and perhaps in a uh, uh, mixed signal at this particular time the Russians declined to conduct those investigations they cancel uh, the uh, uh, maneuvers they canceled the exercises and said that future exercises they would coordinate with the United States elsewhere in Switzerland and other places officials say secret bank accounts and that kind of thing are going to have to be tightened up so that the money supply is cut off officials say to look for uh, stronger pressure brought to bear on the Saudis who may have information for sure and perhaps still financing for uh, some of the groups that may be associated with this. So a broad sweep, again, both at home and overseas, an effort that we're told is going to go on for a very, very long time. All right, Frank, uh, we want you to stay with us. And joining us here in the Washington studio, Brent Scowcroft, uh, General Brent Scowcroft, who was National Security Advisor under former President uh, George H.W. Bush. Yeah. General Skokarov, you've been listening to Frank talk about how important it is uh, that uh, allies, our allies, come on board, that this be a coalition. Why is that so important? Well, it's, it's very important because terrorism is a worldwide phenomenon in the sense that the terrorist networks are all through the Middle East, up to Kashmir, down through, uh, uh, through Africa. They're everywhere, and they communicate everywhere. So it's important that we have the cooperation of our friends and allies uh, in finding out what they're doing, where they're going, and especially this time in retaliation, what we want is to demonstrate that terrorism is unacceptable, that this is not a case of freedom fighters. Uh, this, is, this is a case of pure, unadulterated terrorism and all countries out of support. And uh, Brent Scowcroft, as we uh, talk with you, we're showing pictures of this first, one of the very first flights. We're told to leave Dulles Airport near Washington. We're told it is on its way to Tokyo. Uh, this, I think, symbolic of the fact that the country is just beginning to get back to normal after the horrific events of, uh, of Tuesday morning. Um, having said that, though, uh, General Scowcroft, how can the United States be sure, when it decides to strike, that it's striking the right people? This is one of the most difficult aspects of dealing with terrorism. How do you know you're striking the right people? And how can you demonstrate that a country who may be harboring them is, in fact, harboring them, supporting them, and so on? That's, uh, that's a very difficult thing to do. I'm asking that question, and I want Frank uh, to come in after your answer here, too, but because you do hear more and more people now saying, when you bring up the question of innocent civilians, th the response is, well, they didn't care about innocent civilians in our country. 
uh, why should that be a factor when the United States strikes back? How do you answer that? Well, unfortunately, it, we're not judged by the same standards that the terrorists are. And we're judged by some standards of, of humanity. And some innocent people may be killed in a retaliation. But if we go after the wrong things, the wrong targets and so on. Uh, if you remember after the, the embassy bombings in Africa, uh, President Clinton retaliated. He retaliated in Khartoum against a pharmaceutical plant and in Afghanistan against uh, Osama bin Laden's That's camp. Right. The camp was empty. The pharmaceutical factory was just that. And the president looked like he was uninformed. It was, it, he looked weak rather than strong. And we just, as we just pointed out, uh, uh, one of the things the United States is doing by talking about this every day, it seems to me, is sending signals loud and clear to whoever it is uh, we, we're, we believe is responsible, whether it's Osama bin Laden or someone else, that we're planning this, giving them time uh, to, uh, to get ready. That's right. General Brent Scowcroft joining us. We want to thank you. And uh, now back to Atlanta and Bill Hemmer. Bill. Judy, thank you. We just watched that plane, Air Nippon, take off from Dulles, headed back to Tokyo, Japan, as Judy pointed out. And we have seen increased traffic at various U.S. airports throughout the day today, starting around noon Eastern time. And Patty Davis has been tracking that and more. Patty, what are you hearing at the, the various airports across the country? Well, there is tight security at uh, most of, at all of the nation's airports across the country as they ramp up. The FAA is saying that about 70 percent of those airports are now certified that they do meet the FAA's new increased security standards. Now, those airports, airports include Dulles Airport as well as Atlanta. Los Angeles, the New York airports, Dallas-Fort Worth, they are all open. Notably missing from that, however, Washington's Reagan National Airport. Uh, earlier today, there were snow plows uh, put in place, major, massive size snow plows put in place uh, at, uh, by, the air, by the air traffic control tower uh, to thwart any possible terrorist attack there. Those have now been replaced, we, we've been told, by uh, concrete barriers. Now, the FAA says that uh, these uh, flights that are in the air, about the industry is saying about 1,200 so far today, uh, are not new flights, mostly diverted flights uh, from uh, Tuesday, as well as uh, aircraft being repositioned, the industry trying to reassure passengers who are uh, canceling. My advice is that it is safe to fly. I will be flying. I know that many of our CEOs of the airlines will be flying, as will others. And I would not fly if it were not safe. I would not ask anyone to fly if it were not safe. And that is why we are taking such significant measures to get people pa back in the air. Now, getting those uh, passengers to come back to air travel, obviously critical to the industry, a big economic issue for them. They're stressing those security measures that the FAA has put into place. No curbside check-in, no off-site check-in, no knives to be carried into the airport. Uh, only passengers with tickets allowed to go to the gate. FAA is saying, as I said, that about 70 percent now of the airports are certified to reopen. Uh, still, general aviation not allowed to fly. Those small planes, those corporate jets not allowed to fly, FAA saying the system can't possibly handle all of those flights, including commercial and general, general aviation at the same time. Um, overseas carriers also not allowed to come into the United States. The FAA is saying that overseas carriers will in fact be turned back and I've just been told that there is currently a ground stop in the New York area. A ground stop in New York, is that right Patty at the end there? That's right. Which Apparently, would entail what? Uh, well, what that means, uh, if there's a ground stop uh, in the New York area, meaning that there are no flights allowed to take off in uh, the New York area. And uh, I'm also being told there's some FBI activity at those airports as well. So we're waiting to get more information on exactly what that situation is developing there. Patty, quickly here while we have it here, for people who may be venturing out to travel this weekend by air, what are they saying? Two hours in advance, give yourself to get on that plane or what? Well, the industry, uh, the, the association that represents the industry is saying make sure you're there at least an hour. But Alaska Airlines, in fact, was oh. telling us today, make sure you're there two hours in advance. If you, sh if you show up 20 minutes in advance of these mm -hmm. flights, there is no way you're going to get on. You're going to be left okay. at the gate. Clearly a time for patience. Patty Davis, thanks. Now to Joey, who's with Miles.
Bill, uh, we have with us Miles O'Brien, who is a pilot himself and certainly has a great interest in aviation and what's going on. And in fact, the internet is just a great resource, I guess, of all kinds of things, yeah. additional information. You're able to follow even that flight we were just talking about a short time ago from Dulles. Yeah, just to clarify, this is some proprietary software with some Not internet just connectivity. Anybody can jump in. But basically, if you can get a close up of, the, of this, uh, Mike Hahn, this is ANA Flight 001, which we just saw take off from Dulles Airport. And what this is telling us right now is that it is uh, ascending through uh, 27,000 feet right now. It is traveling at 323 knots. It's a Boeing 747. We know all that. Its departure time, which we just found out, was 5.33 p.m. It arrives. It is Tokyo, I believe, is the destination yes. at 7.06 a.m. local time. Now, so that is, that is real time of the Washington, D.C. area, Dulles Airport being right in there. Let's uh, take a look at what's going on throughout the entire country. Uh, as I try to figure out how to get back. Here we go, zoom out. This is mid-Atlantic, okay? You get a sense of how many planes are there. If, it's, if you can get a little close up, you can see that seems like an awful lot of traffic. There's our ANA flight, just to give you an idea of where we are. We'll zoom out one more time. That gives you the United States. There's ANA again. And that's what's going on across the United States right now. Every one of those blue dots represents a commercial airline flight at the moment. Now, that seems like a lot probably to you, but that is just a small fraction of what you would see on a normal day in the United States. Now let's go into the New York area, for example, where we just heard about that gate hold. Uh, let's go in a little closer there. You can see that's really a sparse amount of traffic for New York. Here's the tip of Manhattan here. Here's Long Island. Um, because they're not all operating at the same altitude or in the same, I mean, it, it does look like a lot to us, but of course we think of them right. on a flat plane. Well, and they're actually at the, And level. there's a little scale issue here. Obviously this plane isn't the, about half the width of, of Long Island. In order for you to see it properly, there's some scale issues. But nevertheless, what you're seeing is real time of these particular flights. This flight happens to be, uh, well, let's get that out of the way, but that happens to be a, uh, I don't know what airline that is, uh, but it is a um, uh, descending through 5,000 feet at 250 knots. Now this one right nearby, seemingly nearby, is probably at an entirely different uh, altitude, and uh, it's actually at uh, 1,500 feet. Uh, flight level 150, 15,000 feet, that's at 391 knots. So what, I'm, what I guess what I'm trying to tell you is it's not as perilous a situation as it may look. But the bottom line is the system is coming alive here. Right, and that is really why you're bringing us this picture. I mean, this is the sort of picture. It doesn't have a lot of practical application to most of us, but this really gives us an idea of the air traffic system back at work. Yeah, we were looking at Los Angeles a little while ago. That's, that's one of the busiest pieces of airspace in our country, Southern California. As you can see, it looks like planes are stacking up on top of each other, but that's the area around Los Angeles. That is, by any normal standard, a very, very sparse day. Things are starting up, but still not quite quite where you would expect them to be. Now, if I were an air traffic controller, is this a picture that I would be looking at, or, or are they looking at something different? Well, this? This, is, this is a computer composite of the radar screen information which they're looking at. They're actually looking at real radar screens, the, the, the cathode ray tubes, if you will. This just takes that data, compiles it all in one place, and gives us this sort of overall representation. This is not the kind of fidelity you'd want your air traffic controller to have. You might cause some problems. A little insight on aviation from our Miles O'Brien, a pilot himself, and certainly somebody who has studied a lot of this information. Thanks very much, Miles. All right, we want to go back immediately to Judy now. There's some developing information from Washington. Judy. Uh, Joey, I've just been told that the United States Senate is being evacuated. That, of course, is one half of the capital of the United States. Uh, our producer there, Dana Bash, uh, all we know at this hour, she's saying, is that we don't know the reason, but people are being evacuated from the Senate. I think we do want to put this in some perspective. Throughout this day, there have been evacuations uh, in Washington, in New York City. We know earlier today the building where CNN's offices are uh, in New York was evacuated. There was a report about LaGuardia Airport in New York. Uh, for a fact, here in Washington earlier today, American University had received a threat, and they were canceling classes starting about 10 o'clock this morning. And uh, now, Dana Bash, our producer at the Capitol, is on the phone. Dana, what can you tell us? Uh, hi, Judy. I can tell you, we are, I'm currently standing outside uh, the Senate at the swamp site. There are senators all around me. About three minutes ago, uh, I was standing outside the Senate chamber uh, when a police officer said, everybody must evacuate now. Don't ask questions. Just leave the building immediately. Uh, and then there was a mass exodus to the, to the exits. Everybody ran out. I just quickly talked to Senator John Burrow from Louisiana. He said that the police came onto the Senate floor where they were actually having a vote, and they said, just get out. 
ask questions, just get out, and he said that everybody ran for the doors. Uh, I'm currently standing, like I said, right across from uh, the plaza on the lawn looking at the Capitol, and there are just senators all around kind of looking uh, looking around, trying to figure out what's going on, where to go. Nobody really knows, but everybody is pretty much calm. Everybody is, is looks relatively calm. Uh, before I was upstairs, uh, when everyone told us to leave, I was downstairs one floor below staking out an appropriations uh, meeting. There were appropriators who were talking about how much money to give uh, uh, for, you know, for the um, rescue efforts in New York and for intelligence and law enforcement operations. Uh, uh, there was started to be a little bit more movement in there uh, after uh, Senator Lott and Senator Daschle came in to participate in the negotiations. Uh, they brought a couple of canine dogs in, and uh, there were more security around that room. Uh, as as uh, as time went on, uh, suddenly uh, Senator Lott and Senator Daschle were quickly escorted upstairs towards their offices on the second floor. Uh, they looked kind of kind of panicked, kind of hurried. Uh, and the officer, security officers took them to the second floor. Uh, myself and a couple other reporters followed them up to the second floor uh, where security was trying to figure out where to take them. They took Senator Lott into his office on the second floor of the Capitol. They started to take Senator Daschle down towards the House side, and they quickly turned him around and brought him back into the Senate chamber. That's, yeah. when, that's when we decided that, that's when we were told, excuse me, that we should evacuate the building immediately. Now, Dana, uh, it, help, you know, we, the Senate is, of course, the north side of the Capitol building. That's now, correct. we're looking at, these are live pictures of people coming out of, this looks like more on the House side, but orient us. What, what are we looking at here? Uh, I'm sorry, Judy, I don't know where the camera is that you're, that you're looking at. Okay. I think it's probably on the House I side. I think this is, this is, this is the House side. We, we, the camera quickly panned over to the other side of the Capitol. There aren't that many people coming. Well, now we see a few more coming out. Dana, what about security measures at the Capitol? How much have they been stepped up since uh, Tuesday morning? Uh, they have been stepped up quite a bit. Um, certainly on Wednesday, uh, there was a wider perimeter around the Capitol. Uh, instead of checking our IDs and our parking passes right at the at the gates of the Capitol, or at least at, right at the entrance to the Capitol parking, it was uh, about a two or three block perimeter around the Capitol that they were checking IDs. Uh, today it was a little bit more uh, kind of business as usual. They just checked our all of our IDs um, uh, as we were coming into the Capitol. But there has been a, certainly a more visible presence of security, and there haven't been any regular Capitol tours around today. All right, so uh, Dana Bash uh, reporting the Senate side, and now we're looking at the House side of the United States Capitol being uh, evidently being evacuated as well. Our correspondent, uh, congressional correspondent Jonathan Carl, is on the uh, phone now with us. Jonathan, what have you learned? Well, I'm standing literally about 10 feet away from Senator Daschle, the Senate leader who is conferring with John McCain and John Kerry and Patrick Leahy. Uh, many senators have come out here, asked Daschle what is going on. I'll tell you, they look extremely calm because what they believe is this was a suspicious package uh, that was found. And uh, Daschle told uh, one of the other senators that the dogs, meaning the bomb-sniffing dogs, reacted negatively. Uh, in other words, that it was did not contain a bomb. Uh, but uh, one of the uh, Capitol Hill police came over to Daschle uh, a while ago and said this would take about 15 minutes to to clear and to make sure the situation is under control. Uh, but a, but a state of real calm out here um, behind the Capitol. You know, senators conferring, waiting to be able to go back in. Um, much different from what it was just uh, five or six minutes ago when everybody was running out, being told by the police that they had to immediately evacuate. Well, we certainly don't want to minimize any threat uh, in this uh, atmosphere that we're in after Tuesday morning. Everything has to be taken seriously. But having said that, uh, today, yesterday, there have been a series of, of hoaxes, threats. A number of places have been evacuated. As I said, American University here in Washington completely evacuated earlier today. Kate Snow, uh, you're joining us now on the telephone. Tell us where you are, Congressional Judy, Correspondent. Yeah, Judy, I'm actually next to the camera, the shot that you're looking at. I'm actually standing right next to that camera. These are members of the House that you see coming down the steps. Uh, we don't have a great shot here. But the House of Representatives, they have all been inside receiving an intelligence briefing. Uh, I also see pages, a lot of pages. These are uh, young people who work in the Congress. 
coming down the steps. Now, the Senate had been evacuated first, we understand, and based on John Carl's reporting, uh, that was because of some sort of suspicious package. All this is very preliminary. The House had not been evacuated, but based on what I'm seeing right now, it looks like they are now evacuating the House of Representatives. Judy, very little information about why. Um, all I can tell you is that people are very much on edge here, as they are in many parts of the country right now. And when someone says the word evacuation, uh, I think that's why you see some people moving rather quickly. That's Judy. right. They take it seriously. And, and as we're sitting here, you have to think what is going on in the, in the minds and the operations of these security people, because if they are receiving a number of threats, which one has to assume they are all the time, they've got to be able to distinguish between what's real and what isn't. And uh, we heard John Carl saying, uh, Senator Daschle, the Senate Democratic leader, the Senate Majority Leader, saying a uh, suspicious package found. The dogs didn't uh, react uh, in a way that would uh, make, give them cause for concern, but they went ahead and acted on that anyway. Now, we don't know if there's some other development that has caused the uh, uh, security folks to have the, the Capitol uh, evacuated. But as you can see, it is proceeding. People are pouring out of the House side, Kate Snow telling us these are members of Congress and others who work in the staff. And right now we see uh, security vehicles pulling up. This looks like at least a part of a motorcade. People running to jump in. Uh, I can only guess who is in there or nearby. Uh, and But again, more members of Congress and others who work at the Capitol coming down these stairs. This is just, uh, you know, as no one who's watching is surprised to know, this is just a very tense uh, time, uh, not just in Washington and New York and in many other of our uh, uh, important uh, large cities around the country where uh, uh, people who work uh, in government, uh, people who work in finance, uh, in, as New York has seen, have reason, every reason now to... Uh, to wonder whether the next threat that comes along is a real one. Judy, Kate, uh, yeah, let me tell you a couple of things, Judy. I just was talking to members as they're walking by here. I'm told that there's a suspicious package uh, verifying what John Carl had reported. I'm also told by our producer, Ted Barrett, that he's just spoken with the spokesperson for the Speaker of the House, Dennis Hastert, who says, indeed, there was a suspicious package and that, in his words, a dog got a hit on it. In other words, a, a dog found it to be suspicious. This is all very preliminary, Judy, but that's what we're hearing as of right this moment, that there was a suspicious package, and that's why they're evacuating the members of the House. Yeah, the, these, uh, these are the kinds of uh, situations where we can only piece information together. We're not able to talk directly with the people in charge of security. We're basing this on, uh, well, in some instances, we think secondhand information. Uh, uh, John Carl had talked with uh, Senator Daschle. You've been talking with a an aide to uh, House Speaker Dennis Hastert. Uh, I don't know if John Carl, John Carl, are you still with us? Yes, I am. I'm, I'm actually, uh, uh, yes, go ahead, Judy. No, go ahead. I just wanted to ask you what the reaction is. What are people saying as they stand around there and wait? I'm standing next to Senator McCain. Would you like to ask him directly? Sure. He's right here is one of those had to evacuate. Here he is. This is Judy. Hello, Judy. Hello, uh, Senator seen, John I McCain. I haven't seen uh, all the senators this close together in many years. Uh, are people taking this seriously? Oh, I'm sure that they're taking it seriously. Otherwise, they wouldn't have told us to come out here on the lawn. Is this the first evacuation order since Tuesday morning at the Capitol? As far as I know, as when I've been here, it's the first evacuation since, uh, since Tuesday morning, yes. My, my, understanding is, my understanding is that, uh, and this is third hand, is that there was a suspicious package uh, in the Capitol is what, is what I heard. But uh, I'm not sure positive that's true. Senator McCain, you've, you've been around a long time. You've worked, obviously, in the military. You, you know how some of these security operations work. How do the security people go about distinguishing between what's a real threat and what's a hoax? I, I don't know, except that in the case of if, if it's just a phone call, it has to have some kind of corroboration. Again, this is third hand, and I hesitate to repeat it, but I was told that the dogs reacted negatively to this package, was the reason why they gave it some credibility. So, uh, But I want to tell you that I heard that third hand, and I'm sure that uh, if, if I gave you an inaccurate depiction of the situation, that uh, it'll be cleared up within an hour or so. 
But, Senator, isn't it your sense that the security has been beefed up there at the Capitol since uh, the, the incidents of Tuesday? Oh, absolutely. The security has been beefed up, and I think it's very appropriate that that be the case. All right. Uh, Senator, Senator John McCain. All right. I'm going to give uh, you back to your crack correspondent here, okay? All right. All right John, Senator John McCain uh, answering some questions for us, borrowing the telephone of our, our correspondent, uh, Jonathan Carl. Uh, Jeff Greenfield, who is our CNN senior analyst uh, in New York City, is, uh, is with us now. Jeff? Judy, this is one of the costs of what happened Tuesday, and it's one of the, one of the costs that is going to roll through this country for an indeterminate number of time, times. The purpose, if the purpose of terrorism is to terrorize, is to make us insecure. What we've seen the last two days is the secondary fallout from the horror that's a couple of miles over my shoulder. We've had the Empire State Building evacuated. We've had Penn Station evacuated. There's every reason to think that malicious or stupid or deranged people will be calling in threats on everything from airlines to trains to public buildings. Uh, you remember Inauguration Day, how upset some of us were that people going on to the mall to hear the speech of the new president were screened for the first time in American history, I believe. And That's one right. of the things that is going on is that the, the, the attack on the World Trade Center has ruffled through the entire country and made insecurity a way of life. And it's only, we don't know how long this is going to go on. That's right, Jeff. I mean, we have seen uh, in the last few days untold numbers of buildings evacuated in Washington and in New York. I've been saying just today, I was told that at one point they were uh, in New York, they were going to evacuate LaGuardia Airport. Now, I don't know if that was actually carried out. And it's beyond we, that, Judy. You know, it's things like the uh, waiter at a restaurant saying, my wife just called, they found a bomb in the Brooklyn Macy's. No, they didn't. But those are the kinds of stories that ripple through neighborhoods and ripple through communities and make everybody on edge. And it's one of the things, I believe, that terrorists try to do when they strike at targets like they did here in New York. I mean, even, give me one small example. The voting machines in New York are all, in every school and apartment building, they're shuttered. That was supposed to happen on Tuesday. That's the way we decide things. But that's been postponed. You know, you can't use a credit card in a lot of shops and, and restaurants. And you've got a tiny indication of the financial fallout. And we always look at, we look, of course, for understandable reasons, at the major unimaginable horrors. Sometimes it's these little things that indicate just how deeply this act has struck. No question about it. And Jeff, uh, Capitol Police now confirming that uh, both sides of the Capitol, if you will, both houses of the Capitol, both the Senate, which we first uh, had word of from our producer, Dana Bash, uh, and then the House, uh, it's simply two parts of one building, the Capitol, the dome you see there, uh, the right side of it, uh, if, if I, the camera's where I think it is, would be the House side, the left side, the Senate, the left being the north and the other side the South. But you can only imagine what is going on in the minds of these uh, uh, security uh, for authorities as they try to figure out what's a real threat and what's one that we can just discard and not worry about. That's exactly the point. It is, it is that every crank phone call now has the credibility of the biggest horror that has ever been visited on the mainland of the United States behind it. And who can, who can blame them for taking seriously what they would have dismissed or handled with a, a grain of salt 72 hours ago? This is one of the many prices we are going to be paying for what has happened here. All right. Now uh, we want to go to our congressional correspondent, Kate Snow, who's talking with one of the Democratic leaders in the House. Kate. Judy, this is the second ranking Democrat in the House, David Bonnier, Democrat from Michigan. A man who's clearly very calm right now. Tell me what you know about what's happened here. Well, we were on the House floor and we we're getting an intelligence briefing by the uh, by the intelligence community. And the House floor was filled with members of the House, and and uh, I was told by a staff that uh, there had been some evacuation in the Senate. And uh, then I saw so I grabbed Bob Menendez, who was sitting next to me. We rushed downstairs to see what was going on through the sergeant at arms office. And he came up the stairs at the same time, mentioning that there was a, a package, member. a package. It was uh, unidentified and uh, that they wanted to clear the uh, Capitol. So people have come out of the Capitol and are on the grounds now, and they're checking it out. And do you know where that package is or what kind of a package I do is? not. I don't know any details other than that. I heard sir, some rumors in the back here about the Hart Building as well. Uh, that's one of the Senate, that's one of the office, Senate buildings. office buildings. It's uh, just uh, a block from here. 
Uh, but obviously, they, they're, they're, not, they're not taking any chances, and they shouldn't. When they evacuated you all on Tuesday, it was the first time in history that there had been a mandatory evacuation of this capital, and now this is the second time yes. in history. Does that strike you? Do you think we're on a very trigger-sensitive time right well, now? Well, people are sensitive, obviously, but they will not close this capital down. We are going right back into the capital. We're going to do the business of this country. And uh, those who have perpetrated this crime against this uh, nation are going to be dealt with uh, uh, justly, but severely and swiftly. They, I noticed they did not take the Speaker of the House. I believe he's right over here to our right. Yeah, he's just down, he's the, just the, down wall the way here. there. The Speaker was evacuated on Tuesday immediately as soon as they knew about the Pentagon incident. Uh -huh. Does that tell us something that he's still standing here? Does that tell us that they don't take this as seriously? 